Terrific. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicki Gass, and I am the executive director of the Latin America Working Group. I'm the um, and we will be starting our event today at in, in, in a couple of minutes, just as we uh, resolve some technical challenges. Uh, could you please put in the chat if you are able to hear me? One, oh, hold on a minute. Terrific, let's try that again. If you can hear us or hear me, please put uh, a yes in the chat. We're getting some thumbs up here in the audience. Everybody is saying yes. Thank you so much for your, your participation. Are we ready to go? Terrific. Um, my name again is Vicki Gass. I am the executive director of the Latin America Working Group, uh, a group that's about 40 years old, uh, working to have or, or, or forge U, uh, just US policies towards Latin America. Uh, we work in several countries uh, and regions in, in the hemisphere, uh, and Cuba is one of them. Uh, LOG has had a long history trying to normalize U.S. relations with Nicaragua, uh, excuse me, with Cuba. We do recognize that uh, the U.S. embargo against Cuba is really a, a Cold War relic that has not, uh, has not, uh, had the expected changes they want, it hasn't worked, and it has been more harmful to the Cuban people. Moving uh, ahead to the Biden administration, in May 2022, uh, the Biden administration announced that it would make some steps to improving relationships between the two countries, including um, opening up commercial flights to Cuba and also uh, uh, resuming commercial flights to the region. Um, but what has happened is that they're continuing with uh, Cuba on the uh, state uh, sponsor of terrorist list, which has really um, dire repercussions, which I can talk about a little more. But before I do that, I would really like to uh, welcome you all here and thank you for coming today and introduce our two panelists here. Um, first, uh, we have Alejandro Garcia del Toro, uh, the Chargé d'Affaires from the Cuban uh, Consulate here in Washington, and also Paula Walsh, who's the co-chair of the National Network on Cuba. I'd also like to thank our other sponsors, the Institute for Policy Studies and uh, Code Pink. We did invite people from Code Pink here to speak, but for a variety of reasons, they were not able to make it, um, but we'll, we'll see them uh, in, in future events on Cuba. Um, talking about uh, the, the state sponsors of terrorism, it, it has had a really detrimental effect on uh, the people of Cuba. Last week, I participated in an event here in this room with some entrepreneurs from Cuba who discussed um, and described um, in, for their work as, as business people what um, the, the SSOT has done for them. And I just wanna give a couple of examples of what they said. They said um, they can't get the materials for their product. They can't keep people uh, on or hire people to do the work. 3% uh, of the population in Cuba is, is attempting to uh, leave the island because of, of lack of opportunity. 
Um, and last year, over 300,000 people, if I have my numbers correct, or have uh, left. And um, it's compounded by the fact that there is an aging population in uh, Cuba, Cuba uh, today. Uh, these uh, business people can't satisfy their customers uh, and, and their desire for their product um, or their services. One was a filmmaker because they can't open bank accounts, so they can't get loans and they can't use platforms or services such as, as PayPal. Um, one speaker spoke the fact that she had, had applied to open accounts in 14 banks in the United States and elsewhere and was denied the ability to do that. So they have no bank accounts, they have no access to capital, they can't contribute to the community and economic development um, and building Cuba up from the ground up, or as one of them said, um, have be able to say HO in Cuba, made in Cuba. Today, our speakers are gonna expand on, on what these speakers spoke about last week and talk about um, Cuba from their perspective and, and, and the problems with the state sponsors of terrorism. I have three questions that I'm going to answer them, uh, ask them and, and they uh, will in their own words answer them. The first is, can you describe the impact that the SSOT on Cuba or the fact that Cuba is, is on the SSOT is having on the, the people of Cuba, everyday Cubans? And then what are steps that the Cuban government is taking to um, try to help resolve the, the, the crisis um, facing the, the island or open doors of communication with the United States? And then lastly, what can we do here in the United States? What, what are the policies that we need to be advocating for, pushing for? What are the actions that we need to take? After they um, do their presentations, then we will move into questions and answers and discussion with all of you, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Would you like to start? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Vicky, and thank you to the Latin American Working Group, and to the National Network in Cuba, and to all the organization that has set this event. Um, first of all, uh, before talking about the impact on the Cuban economy and the Cuban population, about being in the terrorism sponsor list, I think that it's important to say something about the history of the, this designation. Because from the beginning, the goal of the US government has been to uh, two things. First, in try to annihilate the Cuban population, trying to uh, 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 destroy, to create obstacle to the a standard of living uh, of our population for years. And the second, and maybe the first, is just to uh, justify the policy of sanctions and the policy of blockade again our country, and to justify the permanent goal of the American political elite to control the Cuban sovereignty and the Cuban destiny. That's two things that is important before talking about any uh, other aspect. Uh, we have to remind that the designation was uh, established in 1982 uh, by the Reagan administration in the moment when the conservative in the US was uh, really high. And the, since the beginning of his administration, Reagan was very clear for uh, uh, that the goal was to, uh, to damage the Cuban sovereignty. In the documents of Santa Fe, who was the programmatic uh, basics of the Reagan administration, Santa Fe first and Santa Fe second, uh, the Republican Party was very clear about the intentions of, of, about using the, the sanctions against our country, about uh, how to uh, manipulate of these issues about the human rights in Latin America and the human rights in many countries and the human rights in Cuba as a, as, as a way to, uh, to, to paint a bad picture about our reality and then to justify the sanctions that has been uh, the, the, the normal policy of the US since the 60s against our country. So, and then for more than three, almost four decades, we were in the list until 2015 when 
Obama administration decided to remove Cuba from the list uh, on the idea that it was any uh, it wasn't any just justification to of being part of that list because Cuba is not a state sponsor of terrorism and we were uh, out of the list until uh, the Trump administration decided to reinclude Cuba nine days before he left the office. So at the moment when former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the Senator from Florida, Marco Rubio, pushed it for that decision, they knew that they were creating a lot of obstacles for the Biden administration to do positive things uh, with Cuba to re take the Obama's policy if they uh, put Cuba again on the list. So they did it and, and that's the, the reality that we have today. Uh, despite of the promise that President Biden made one year before he took the White House about retaking the Obama's policy, that has not happened. Uh, even during the, his three years on the White House, the, uh, the damages to the life of the Cuban people, to the Cuban economy uh, has been even uh, multiplied because of the impact of the, not only by the sanctions, adding to the pandemic dynamic for all countries around the world, including the, 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 the first economies. And all those factors created a kind of a scenario for the Cuban uh, people and for the Cuban government that has been very uh, difficult to, to, to face, very uh, difficult to handle for the Cuban government on how to sustain our free healthcare, our free education system from the pre-K to the university under these conditions, because it's not only about uh, being in the terrorism sponsor list, it's, it's more than that because Trump uh, issued more than 240 measures against the Cuban economy to almost to destroy our, our economy, to cut any links between the Cuban uh, economy and the rest of the world. And everybody, everybody knows that we are an open economy because we need ex to export and we need uh, to do make a lot of imports in order to, to get the, the supplies for the medicine, the supply for the, our school and university system, to get all the, the, the raw material that we need to run the economy. And at the same time, we need to export. So the idea and the goal of the, by the, the Trump administration was how to uh, dismantle our, our economic connection and our trade connection. But despite of that uh, effort, we were able to uh, survive uh, the, the sanctions. We were able to survive the pandemic. We, under this condition, very tough condition, and the conditions that even Biden has kept, we uh, were able to vaccinate the 92% of the population for COVID. We uh, have been able to, uh, to continue our development in a very, maybe a slow uh, pace, but uh, thinking on the idea that we cannot wait for the U.S. government to, to fight for our development. We have to continue our effort to diversify our economy. We have made a lot of change in our economic structure in, in Cuba, giving more space to the private uh, sector, to the medium and the small companies in order to uh, generate uh, uh, um, 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 employment and new, new employees, employment. And, uh, but the, the fact is that being on the a state sponsor of terrorism list uh, provoked a lot of problems for the, for, the, for the economy, a lot of problems for the people. And it's not only about uh, the problems and obstacles for the entrepreneurial movement in Cuba, it's the normal uh, problems and the uh, huge obstacle for the normal life of the people. When you uh, say someone in Cuba that your relative cannot go to a, uh, to a surgery because there is no enough or there is no in the, in the stock, there is no a specific supply for surgery. And that the cause of not having that is because someone, uh, a foreign company doesn't want to sell to Cuba that device because we are in the terrorism sponsor list. Any normal person, even a Cuban who is a very and smart people cannot really understand what is the link between being a supposed terrorist state 
and that my relatives cannot get access to a, maybe a, a device for a heart surgery or something like this. And all uh, these apply for everything, everything uh, that we, uh, our citizens face on, on, on our daily life, even on the education, on health. So for the people of Cuba, uh, it's really uh, uh, hard to understand. Even when we see uh, about our own decisions, the decision by the Cuban government, because last month we uh, held a dialogue with the US about uh, how to cooperate against the terrorism just six weeks ago. So many people in Cuba asked, what, what, what is the, 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 the need to talk with the US on cooperation against the terrorism if the US government say that we are a state sponsor of terrorism. So there's, there's a very difficult to explain. There is a very difficult to, I'm trying to give a, a reasonable uh, argument to many in Cuba that really don't understand. Um, and they understand at the same time that this is just a lie. This is just a manipulation by the American government. And no matter if it's a Republican administration or a Democratic, a Democrat administration, it's just a lie. And all this about the designation has been a big lie from the beginning. And when you see what happened in the, because in the same day that in Cuba, uh, we were uh, said in uh, uh, the, the signature of the agreement, peace agreement between the ELN and the Colombian government. And that was the argument by the, by the, by the Trump administration to re-include Cuba in the list about the, the deny of Cuba to uh, send back the some Colombian uh, directive of the ELN to Colombia because of the supposed involvement in a, in a, in a kind of a, uh, terrorist action, something like this. And at, at that moment in Havana, we were signing uh, that agreement. And in the same day when the signature was taking place, the thing that being a, tourism, a terrorist state has been replaced by this new lie and this new false argument about the supposed building of a Chinese uh, espionage space Thank in you. Cuba. And now two weeks later, there is no espionage basis. There is a basis to train Chinese troops in Cuba. So all the time is, uh, is about using the lie, using the manipulation of facts to justify the annihilation of the Cuban population and the, the intention to control the, the sovereignty of Cuba. Great, thank you so much. Oh. Okay, thank you. Not that close. Thank you so much, everybody. I am I'm going, going to, to turn it over to uh, my colleague here on, on my left and, oh, you have one and, um, <laughs> Okay, and um, and then we'll go on to other questions about what can be done uh, from here in the United States to change the situation. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen if that's possible. While we're waiting for that, I, I think it is absolutely infuriating that this has been going on uh, way too long, that there were some advances under the Obama administration, but uh, Trump, uh, like so many things, has um, turned the clock on that. But it's infuriating with the Biden administration because they have this discourse, for instance, in Central America about promoting trade and commerce, um, but that's exactly what they're not allowing uh, Cuba to do. Uh, with with this uh, with the blockade, the ongoing embargo, and and uh, also um, with Cuba being on the the state sponsor of terrorism, and uh, it's also um, outrageous that they deny Cuba to play a, a political diplomatical role as they did in Colombia, um, um, and helping forge the signing of, of a peace agreement between the Colombian government and the ELN. And, and it's sabotaging everything that you're trying to do. 
are we all set so sorry for the delay um thank you so much for okay is this good <laughs> all right thank you so much for having us i'm really excited to be here alongside alejandro and vicky at the ips and before i start my presentation i just want to explain a little bit about what the national network on cuba is we are a coalition and umbrella organization of about 57 different member orgs and the work that we're doing is really to unite all of these groups, um, whether they're peace groups, faith groups, local community organizations, different parties, to unite the work that we're doing to end the US blockade on Cuba and to come across you know, political differences on other issues to really um, be united in this fight against um, this cruel US policy against Cuba. So I think in my presentation, I'm definitely gonna focus on the third question about what can we do as US people um, because NNOC, as the slide shows, is organizing the off the list uh, weekend of action to get Cuba off the state sponsors of terrorism list and to lift all US sanctions. So what is the SOT list? I'm just gonna build on what my fellow presenters have already shared. Um, it's really important to remember the SOT list is created and maintained only by the United States. But because of the immense power that the US has in the global financial system, this designation has really big impacts on Cuba and on all the countries that are listed. Um, even if you know it's, it's legal for a bank to trade with Cuba or to exchange with Cuba, um, often they are scared away from doing it simply because of the fact that the US has sued other countries and other entities, even its own allies, hundreds of millions of dollars for trading with Cuba. So just this word terrorist um, is a, a fear tactic and a way to demonize Cuba and isolate Cuba. Um, and what this designation does is exacerbate all of the already really devastating impacts of the US blockade on Cuba, which is the most severe and prolonged sanctions regi regime in the world. So these are a few of the impacts listed here. Um, not only is it you know, restricting US foreign assistance, um, getting loans, but it's also impacting just regular people in the US who want to exchange with their family in Cuba, send money to their family in Cuba, it restricts visas for non-US citizens who have traveled to Cuba and then want to enter the US because they visited a so-called terrorist country. And really what this does is hurting the very people in Cuba that Biden claims to want to be helping. Um, you know, Some of the people who've been most vocal to Biden on asking him to remove Cuba from this list are entrepreneurs, people who work in small businesses and cooperatives. Biden always justifies his Cuba policy saying we support the Cuban people. But in reality, the blockade isn't just targeted at a small group of people in Cuba, it is punishing the entire population. Um, and it's also barred not just trade, but people to people exchange between the US and Cuban people. Yeah, I don't know if I can hide that. Just hmm. All right. Um, so we already went over a little bit of the history of the list. Um, Cuba was added by Reagan, removed by Obama in 2015. And on January 11th, 2021, Cuba was added back to the list by Trump. And this date is, of course, significant because it was a few days after the January 6th riots and just days before Trump left office. So he's setting up Biden for the political obstacle he's currently in where he's getting pressure from the left and the right to either take Cuba off the list, like we're telling him to, or to keep Cuba on the list, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, this effort by some right-wing Republicans in Congress to pass the, the so-called force acts. Um, and what Biden has done is really doubled down on the idea that Cuba is a so-called state sponsor of terrorism, but they provided very little actual proof or evidence for this claim. Um, for example, just this April, Cuban and US officials met in Havana to discuss cooperating and communicating on anti-terrorism efforts. And then just a couple of weeks later, Biden reaffirmed that Cuba is a so-called state sponsor of terrorism and said that they're on this list of countries that aren't cooperating with US anti-terrorism efforts, which is obviously ridiculous considering weeks before they hosted the US for these uh, cooperation talks. And when the Biden administration has been asked about why Cuba is a so-called state sponsor of terrorism, especially when they're actively doing peace talks, they've pretty much deflected the question and not provided any actual examples of 
sponsoring terrorism. They've just said, oh, the regime has a long history of doing this. Um, so it's very vague and it's because there is no real justification for this listing. And what's clear is that the US people do not agree with the US government's policy towards Cuba. And this gets to the fact that the blockade itself is a fundamental violation of democracy. It's a violation of Cubans' democratic right to determine their own future, uh, to decide their own system. It's a violation of the US people's democracy to actually have a say over our country's policy towards Cuba. And a majority of US people have long been opposed to the blockade, especially on food and medicine. And it's also a violation of global democracy because 96% of countries on earth repeatedly uh, condemn the US blockade um, in the United Nations. So this is a list of some examples just in the past couple of years of how US people have really made their voices loud and clear that Cuba is not a terrorist state and that in fact, we should be ending this US economic terrorism towards Cuba. Um, labor unions and city councils and local governments have passed over 90 resolutions uh, supporting an end to the blockade, promoting scientific cooperation with Cuba, and telling Biden to take Cuba off the list. Including DC. Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, the DC yeah. Council unanimously passed a resolution um, condemning the listing of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. Um, all 33 member states of the community of Latin American Caribbean states have demanded that the US remove Cuba, um, including Colombia, um, which Cuba is sponsoring the peace talks for and which Trump used to justify listing Cuba. And for the past couple of years, led by the Puentes de Amor movement, there have been monthly car caravans and rallies, um, not just across the US, but in cities across the world. Um, and just to list off a few other examples quickly, um, over 100 Democratic House members have urged Biden to remove Cuba from the list. Cuban and American business owners have been advocating for this. And thousands and thousands of US people and progressive advocacy groups and lawyers are sending letters to Biden um, telling him to take Cuba off the list. And even people in the intelligence community have admitted that this designation is bogus, that it's kind of an open secret within the US intelligence community that Cuba is not actually sponsoring terrorism and that this listing is simply used to demonize Cuba and to justify the blockade. And as Alejandro mentioned earlier, um, there is this media war on Cuba, which is also used to continue justifying the blockade and creating this idea that Cuba is a so-called state sponsor of terrorism. As we saw, as soon as this peace agreement was passed with the leadership of Cuba, these fear-mongering, war-mongering stories come out, um, just modeling Cold War propaganda against Cuba and China about this so-called um, Chinese spy base on Cuba. So what are we doing about this? Um, the Off the List campaign is an effort that the NNOC has been leading this entire year uh, to get Cuba off the state sponsors of terrorism list. And we are planning a whole weekend of activities starting tomorrow, um, going through Sunday, to take different forms of action um, to really make the voices of the US people loud and clear that we don't see Cuba as a terrorist state and that in fact, we see Cuba as a victim of US sponsored terrorism. So this is a map of where protests are taking place around um, the US, around Canada, and there's also other countries that are hosting protests. And we're really focusing on mobilizing here in DC, where will we, be, we will be rallying at the White House. So this is a little bit of a preview of our weekend schedule. Um, and what's really important here is that, you know, there isn't just one terrain of struggle on which we're advocating for Cuba. We are going to be rallying in the streets, in the halls of Congress. We're going to be meeting with our representatives. Um, we're going to be sharing political education, music, art, culture, and so much more. Um, so Thursday and Friday, we're hosting some advocacy days um, with Code Pink and Acere to advocate against the Force Act. And we have a really broad coalition of organizations that are supporting these actions. It's had over 90 endorsements. There are dozens of protests around the country. Um, Puentes de Amor, which is a Cuban American group, um, the Canadian Network on Cuba, the Amazon Labor Union, uh, Code Pink, Acere, the Answer Coalition, all these groups have really united to help us make these rallies happen. And I want to talk for a second about these advocacy days that we're planning um, tomorrow and on Friday, 
because as I mentioned earlier, right now there's this effort by extreme right-wing Florida Republicans to codify into law Cuba's designation as a so-called state sponsor of terrorism so that Biden couldn't undo it. No president could undo it to have to be um, passed by Congress to take Cuba off the list. And not only that, but Cuba would have to meet these basically impossible conditions to completely um, change their government and change their political and social systems to be what the US determines to be free in order to be taken off the list. So again, this is an example of how US policy towards Cuba is ultimately about denying Cuba's right to self-determination, to sovereignty, and their right to decide their own systems. So even if you're not in DC, um, I definitely encourage people to um, set up a meeting with their representatives to ask them to vote no on the FORCE Act and to advocate normalizing US-Cuba relations. And with that, I'm going to wrap up, but we have uh, a website page and a toolkit with all of the resources for the Off the List campaign to learn more about the SOT list, the blockade, their impacts, how you can take action um, in your community or in DC. Um, so there's a lot of great resources here and we're working with many great organizations who've contributed um, so much to this campaign. So I'll stop screen sharing there, but thank you. Thank you, Carla. And uh, I think uh, the, the message is loud and clear that we need to get our representatives to vote no on the FORCE Act. Uh, so whether you're in Maryland or Virginia or even in DC where we have taxation without representation, uh, you need to let people, you let your elected officials know that they should vote no on the FORCE Act. You also had something there for at a reception at Best Boys and Poets, and there are several now. And which one would that be? Cheryl? <laughs> uh, it's 450 K Street. 450 K Street. Yep, she'll repeat it. Yeah, so on Saturday night, um, the DC Metro Coalition in solidarity with the Cuban Revolution is hosting um, an event where there will be speakers from the Cuban embassy, performances, um, celebrations, and then we're going to go to the Busboys and Poets on 450 and K Street. Um, and the founder of Busboys and Poets, Andy Shalal, played a really instrumental role in passing this resolution through the DC Council. So we're excited to celebrate together the night before the big rally at the White House. And it's also important to point out that these events are taking place in the context of the OAS annual assembly this week. There are a lot of people in town. It's really important to, from, uh, from the hemisphere. And so it's really important to uh, have the visibility of people out there saying no uh, to the US embargo, no to Cuba on the state uh, sponsor terrorist list and uh, an end to the embargo. I'd like to open it up for questions now. And uh, I think uh, Netfa from IPS has the first question. Uh, we're gonna have to, do we wanna share these or how are we gonna do this? Are we gonna repeat the questions, Netfa, or? And we'll be able to, and the Zoom people will be able to hear the questions. I will ask you the ones that are in the Q and A. Okay. Terrific. So and and the people uh, will they hear? They can hear the people in the room that long as you call it saying right here, they can hear you. So okay. It just give me a chance to switch to this is the microphone. Uh-huh. So but you you have the first um when you're ready. One, two, three. Okay. So my I wanted to ask a question to um Alejandro about we don't hear a lot about the terrorism waged against Cuba. You know, and then and the the cost, the human cost, the damage, all that. Is, I mean, so it's so, so ironic that Cuba can be, you know, condemned as a state sponsor of terrorism, but yet be a victim of such an array of terrorism that people don't really know about. Um, that actually even spurred the mission of the Cuban Five, who had to come here. Can you talk more about that? What has Cuba endured in terms of terrorism leveled against Cuba? Really, a big contradiction of this uh, designation is about that uh, Cuba and the Cuban people uh, have been the victim of terrorism, you know, the, the sponsor of terrorism. Uh, almost 3,000 Cuban persons uh, have died in six decades because of the terror, terrorist actions. 
either crafted or uh, prepared or instigated here in the US. So as in uh, one of the uh, huge uh, contradictions that we have been really the victim, not, not the sponsor of terrorism. And uh, at the same time, Cuba has signed it, uh, the 12th uh, international multilateral agreement uh, to fight uh, different forms of terrorism. Even the US is not a uh, uh, state part of the 12th agreement. So this is other uh, uh, fact that uh, most of the people don't know to, uh, regarding our, uh, our very comprehensive effort to cooperate or to fight or to uh, denounce any form of terrorism that uh, for most of the time has been even uh, promoted by the US in different international scenarios. So th these are two, two aspects that uh, few people know. And we, uh, the Q1 uh, uh, tribunal system uh, has issued two sentences, two judgments uh, 20 years ago because of the, uh, the actions that has been um, has had consequence on the Cuban population, either on the economic front or either on the human front, because as I mentioned, almost 3,000 Cuban persons have died in six decades, but other thousands have been injured by terrorist actions that was, uh, uh, by, because since the first week of the revolution, the Cuban uh, revol uh, people suffered terrorist action from the US. Maybe in the first 72 hours, we have started to get some uh, pirate uh, boats, or the burning of uh, two arcane fields, and a lot of things. So um, the, the fact is that, as I said, this is a very uh, uh, a, a high contradiction that we have seen for years uh, as a manipulation of, by the United States government, uh, by the United States media, about the reality about the relation of the history of Cuba and the history of the revolution with the terrorism as a phenomenon, as international phenomenon. Yeah, just to, just to add on um, a bit, I think what this really gets to is that the US can't justify the blockade with facts. It has to use lies that Cuba is a so-called terrorist state when Cuba is actually the biggest exporter of doctors in the world and is helping countries with their peace processes. So not only is this a lie to justify the blockade, but it's also to cover up the history of US terrorism against Cuba, which most US people aren't aware of and, and won't be unless we uh, are getting out there and telling them about it. Terrific. Other questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Uh, we've got a good crowd here. Um, okay, so uh, especially given uh, like the recent Wall Street Journal report that has been that have been released, and especially given the long history of a lot of US media uh, relying heavily on uh, State Department, CIA uh, sources to report on a lot of uh, foreign news. Uh, just, I, just for the panel really, in sort of trying to respond to this, knowing that this is a pattern, this has continued, this has been going on throughout the Cold War, and we see it even today, long after the Cold War supposedly ended, uh, how we can sort of combat that uh, preemptively as opposed to sort of being on the back foot, seeing as this week now, a lot of advocates for Cuba and the Cuban people are now saying, oh, well, we now have to respond to this Wall Street Journal story as opposed to the real goal of supporting the Cuban people, making sure that they are no longer suffering under the SSO2 and such. Well, I would say that uh, the only way to uh, maybe to destroy a lie is just to spread the truth, the truth about the, what Cuba has done, what Cuba is doing today, because it's clear that this is false, this is a lie, and the, the only uh, uh, goal is just to continue 
how to uh, to justify the, the 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 sanctions how to justify the uh, the the political goal to uh, dismantle the Cuban uh, political and economic and social system how to continue to uh, the intention that was set in the Mallory memorandum about to annihilate the Cuban population to destroy all the possibility for the population to survive to get a better life and that's that's the, the, the issue is essentially that Hello? Yeah, you're definitely right that this is a pattern. You know, they're recycling the same exact arguments they used against Cuba when the Soviet Union was around. And I think in particular, they're targeting Cuba and their relationship with China because that could actually provide relief to Cuba from U.S. sanctions and from the, the hardships of the blockade. Um, but I think our duty is, yes, just to spread the truth and to turn the conversation around. One, you know, highlighting the fact that Cuba is a signatory to the agreement of the Latin America and Caribbean as a zone of peace and therefore rejects any presence of foreign military bases in the region. But not only that, why are we talking about this fake uh, Chinese base in Cuba when there is a real illegal U.S. occupation of Guantanamo Bay that has gone on for 125 years? Um, and so that's how NNOC responded to it, like on our social media, that was what we were messaging about because um, these, these lies are just trying to uh, warmonger and to demonize China and Cuba and to justify military buildup around them, to justify just the endless provocations by the US. But in reality, what's, what's really hurting Cuba right now is the illegal occupation of Guantanamo and the torture camp that is um, still in place there and the human rights violations that the U.S. is still committing. So trying to turn the conversation around and show the hypocrisy of the U.S. we found is an uh, effective way to respond to that. And I would just add that forging links. I mean, a lot of what is going on in Cuba right now are bread and butter issues. They want jobs. They want food. They want medicine. These are same similar struggles that people in this country or in Latin America are facing. And, um, and, and just pointing out these are bread and butter issues. Next question. Okay, we have two and the uh, from people online I'm about this, should I read them? Well, the first one is, is it possible to mend relations with Cuba through workforce initiatives that help Cubans gain access to employment and education to America while allowing Americans to work in Cuba? Uh, again, should I read it again? Uh, yeah, I'll repeat it. And I don't know if I can try to, <clears throat> is it possible to mend relationships, relations with Cuba through work, work, workforce, workforce initiatives that help Cubans gain access to employment slash education to America? That's that word that's confused, to America while allowing Americans to work in Cuba. It sounds like work exchanges, I guess. And Cuba, people in Cuba working in here, people here working in Cuba, some sort of. Well, normally, the, um, because of the sanctions, maybe the normal flow of movement and, and trade and people between the two. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, because of the sanctions, because of the uh, very comprehensive uh, level of uh, uh, the, in which the sanctions has been articulated by the US government for six decades, there is no, uh, has been a normal flow of people and citizens from the US or uh, companies or entities and from Cuba to the US as a normal way that maybe could happen between US and other countries because of that skin of sanctions. So I, so I think that uh, in, a, in a normal scenario, uh, that would be possible uh, that having that kind of connections, but uh, the, 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 the kind of flow that we have seen between Cuba and the U.S. has been the migration flow that we have seen between the U.S. and other countries uh, and it's uh, underdeveloped countries as, uh, as usual. But in uh, just trying to ask the, the question is that what I believe that maybe he's trying to, uh, to, to ask or to request. And I would just add to that, I mean, there has been, you know, when there's been more opening exchanges between universities and Cuba, um, people were allowed or medical exchanges, 
And it was that people to people contact and that face to face contact where people were able to uh, see what was happening on the ground in Cuba and come back and realize the uh, misinformation and lies and propaganda from the US government and, and certainly pushing for that uh, level of person to person communication is always critical for any work that we do uh, to destroy uh, sort of the myth of the other. Colin, did you want to add something? I don't have anything to add. Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm going to assume, well, I'm just going to I, add. I have a question. I wanted to know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, Holly, you, you asked your question now. Let me, oh, yeah, go ahead. So, I, I had a question. I wanted to find out if there are any countries that have successfully gotten off the state sponsor of terrorism list and, and without an invasion. <laughs> The question is oh, just to repeat it. They can hear her, so you don't can have you to repeat it. Okay, I don't have to repeat it. Great. In, well, in 2015, Cuba was removed from the list by the Obama administration because of the fact that uh, Vicky mentioned that no no uh, officials, no expert on the uh, intelligence community or in the defense community or in the State Department uh, believed that Cuba is a terrorist state. Like and that reality we have now because now no expert, no officials in any agencies of the U.S. government really uh, believe that Cuba is a terrorist state. But the the government uh, has had the assumption that it's useful having that level just to justify the sanctions because but everyone knows that. Q is not the terrorist state because, it, it, because they have no any proof, any data, any uh, real uh, information that uh, that can be shown to the public to say that Q is a terrorist state because there is no proof. But they need that kind of political uh, maneuver to justify the, the sanctions. And in Obama, just to uh, had that, uh, we could say that approach that there's no real element to justify that, and we have to do a new, a new uh, policy. We have to do something new because the old policy that has been applied for this decade, he said that was not uh, useful, was have no results. So do uh, a new thing to uh, maybe to try to, to to fix this relation in the in the future. But uh, then Trump decided to. Uh, erased or uh, to remove all the things that Obama uh, did well. It's, it's an excellent question, though. I mean, it, this is a state, a U.S. government list. No other countries have uh, a state sponsorship list. And it would be interesting to find out what other countries have been placed on by the U.S. government and how they have got off, if they were able to get off. Kala, would you have any information on that? I think it's something we definitely need to research a lot more um, and compare to Cuba's case. But I think um, what this really gets at is how the designation is purely political. It's detached from facts or evidence or material acts of so-called terrorism. Um, and even Obama officials have, have criticized Trump and Biden saying that they're using this list as a political weapon that it could actually be used to fight real terrorism and instead they're just using it to demonize Cuba instead of its real purpose. And certainly you had a follow up, please. Sorry, I have my other question is, um, I, I don't know much about the, how the international community is viewing these um, immoral and illegal sanctions, but is there a sense of fear in other countries that the US would also use this arbitrarily against them? Is there no huge international outcry against this? Well, certainly there's been, uh -huh. oh, sorry. I think there has been international condemnation throughout these 60 years of uh, the US embargo against Cuba. Not just the embargo, but the Oh, and, and, and the designation on the 
uh, sponsorship. I, I think so Ale... for, dec for decades, uh, the few for decades, few, con few countries has been leveled as a terrorist state by the U.S. Uh, maybe now in the least it could be maybe no more than three or four countries because of different reasons that the United States believe that uh, there are states sponsor of terrorism. But the fact is that this is an unilateral uh, list Absolutely. by the U.S. There is no any basic on the international law or a basing on any resolution by the General Assembly of the UN or the Security Council on giving that role to the US to classify or to designate countries as terrorist state. Uh, but more in general with the sanctions, um, but specifically with the designation. Uh, last week, the CARICOM countries said to Vice President Kamala Harris that about removing Cuba from the terrorism sponsor list, about the sanctions. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the head of the International Commission of the EU openly uh, criticized the decision by the US to com continue to be Cuba in the terrorism sponsor list, Joseph Borrell. So all the international community has been very vocal against the designation uh, because they, they know, and most of those countries, uh, uh, has been impacted by the sanctions and by the designation because all the banking system, most from Europe, from Asia, and from other Latin American countries, used to deny services to Cuba because of having Cuba, has, uh, because of the fact that we are in the list, then their banks used to deny services to Cuba. No matter if the transaction has no connection with the US jurisdiction. If we, wa if we want to buy a uh, wheat in Europe, and then uh, we are using a European or Asian provider and an Asian correspondent bank. And all these transactions has no connection with the US soil. Mm -hmm. But the banks and the companies and the provider used to deny the transaction and the products and the banking services just because we are in the list. Even having the fact that though their, their countries are not in the list or, or have no connection with the with the terrorism or have no connection with the transaction itself. But just because of being in the list, they, because they have fear, they uh, see the list as something that uh, could have some impact in the future for the companies or for the banks. Because many years ago, even the Obama administration uh, set fines against European banks for billions of dollars. Even Obama administration, maybe Obama administration was the one who more impose uh, most imposed fines against European and Asian banks because of having connection with Q, even Obama administration. And if you put a fine of any bank for 1 billion in a sudden, any bank suffer a lot. If, if, if you say to, even to a big bank, if you say that you have to pay me 2 billions to offer or to uh, attorneys and uh, regulators in the US or the treasury regulator in the US, that would be huge for any bank, even for the big banks in Europe. And some of them suffered that fines five, 10, 15 years ago. So the fear is a fact, it's a reality. And when you when you when we want to do something in the international banking system or in the international trade system, we uh, face that kind of uh, very uh, dramatic obstacle. And at the end of the day, all these issues impacted in the normal life of the people because we have no, we cannot import the wheat, we cannot produce the bread, we cannot uh, uh, fix our university or to buy computer for the university. So the, the, the last part of the, uh, the last mile of the sanctions is for the life of the real people and for the persons in their homes, in their communities, in their schools, in their universities. Okay, I'm gonna go, but we got three questions in the, on the Q&A that are online. And if you'll indulge me, I wanna read this comment though from Joe Montrose about the, just kind of answering the question. Iraq, Libya, uh, Yemen, uh, South Yemen and Sudan have previously been on the list, but have been removed. In each case, it was political reasons, for political reasons, the US wanted better relationship relations or the US controlled it like Iraq and Libya. And so that was uh, from Joe Montrose. The next question that's online is three of them. How can the upcoming presidential elections be utilized to bring forth the issue of Cuba on the US state sponsored terrorist list? 
That's a magic question or a real question? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it's a good question. And I think that's true of uh, all of the issues that we care about, whether it's migration or uh, uh, or, or the getting Cuba off the state ter terrorism list, or you know, addressing climate change. I, you know, my concern is that uh, with the the elections, uh, that uh, these issues that are fundamental on so many levels will uh, be take a back seat or put on the back burner, and and really. Um, the, and and Kala, you could, should chime in here, but I, you know, part of it is going <clears throat> to your communities, to your um, local and state officials, and raising this issue with them, and telling them to talk to Washington to get their act in order and call on these um, candidates, um, because uh, we've seen the right has been very uh, clever about this, about organizing on the local level. Um, and influencing policies at the federal level, and, and we need to take a lesson from that. That would be my take, Kala. I would I'd welcome your input on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's we can look at you know past election cycles and how they've impacted U.S. presidents. Cuba policy, for example, you know uh, Obama didn't make major changes until his second term when he felt more safe to. Um, Trump added many more sanctions right during the 2020 election cycle to appeal to extreme right-wing voters, especially um, in Florida. And I think the question in this election is who is Biden going to try to appeal to? In my view, he has already lost those extreme right voters who are already going to be voting for Trump or whoever the Republican nominee is. He, it's no use trying to appeal to them by being more hawkish on mm -hmm. Cuba. Instead, he has an opportunity to not only appeal to, you know, progressive voices, the Cuban Americans who support lifting the blockade and lifting sanctions, but also people within his own party who are telling him these sanctions on Cuba, on Venezuela are contributing to other crises like the crisis at the border with migration. Um, and he has a chance to alleviate that and live up to his campaign promises, which were to uh, lift up the sanctions. And as Vicky said, it's not just the presidential elections that have an impact on this. It's also local elections and congressional elections and Senate races. So it's important that we're putting the pressure on every single one of those races and making people realize we are watching what they're doing on Cuba and that we are waiting to see them um, act and that we will be you know, pressuring them to, to make the right positions. Also, if anybody didn't see uh, Representative Jim McGovern's speech on this very issue of getting uh, Cuba off the state terrorism list, I would uh, encourage you to, to look for it online. No, I just would add that uh, we are very used to hear about the American electoral cycles from the expert, from the people in the, from the staffers about uh, many times, uh, many people, used to uh, ask us to be patient because uh, to wait for the next electoral cycle to wait many months before november last year we continuously hear about you will see that after november midterm biden we would do this we'll do that nothing so we um, but before we have heard that and now we are starting to hear that oh well we have to wait until November and we will see if, if Biden uh, wins the White House or we, uh, we, we could see some decisions, but we uh, really uh, been uh, uh, used to that dynamic. We would say that uh, our plan, our goal is not to wait for any kind of uh, political uh, ele electoral, for the electoral cycle in the US, just to, just to continue to to con our work uh, for the uh, to to, uh, to improve our country, to improve the economy, to uh, because of the obstacles and the obstacles are not le are not less. Are the obstacles are really high, uh, the challenges are really high. But uh, you have seen that despite of that, our country is moving. Our uh, high level officials uh, has been moving around the world, visiting uh, some countries in the last. Uh, months, so we are uh, really in the in the line to uh, diversify our economy, to diversify our trade partners, and to 
uh, find ways to uh, to overcome the the the, the tough si situation that we have faced in the last maybe five six years. Certainly, the U.S. is behind the curve on this one. Uh, no, no. Oh, I just wanted to. Um, it's not a question, but I just wanted to comment on the. I wanted to comment on the state sponsors of terrorism and, and which states have gotten off. And Kaya posted a little a list of the few states that have gotten off. And I don't know what the story is of each one, but I do remember with Sudan it was required to take a number of steps that were in favor of the United States, including the so-called normalization of relations with Israel. And so I think, I, think, I think we have to figure out collectively how to make it so that Cuba and other states don't have to uh, give up so much in order to gain a supposed, uh, or to avoid this designation. The, the issue is that is uh, having this issue been so uh, political, so a manipulation of the, uh, the international relation or the manipulation of the relation between the US and different countries. <clears throat> uh, there is no explanation to, to that because even in the force act uh, bill that is now in the, in the house and in the Senate, you can read that there is, um, they, they mention about the human rights situation in Cuba, if Cuba, uh, does not improve the situation of human rights and that kind of parameter, parameter, parameters. So, but this is no any connection between the human rights issues and being a terror a, and stay sponsor of terrorism. You have to do many different things to in order to get someone considering that you are a sponsor uh, as, a, as a sponsor of state of terrorism. But there is no connection between that and your record in human rights. No matter if your record is worse or is better so but now in the first act they the, the the idea is to make a link between the human rights uh, realities in cuba and the uh, the capacity by the executive branch to remove cuba from the list which is no any kind of uh, really uh, related issues at all so and because what they have been trying to do is to use the or to set the same tool or the same approach that they did with the Helms Burton Act when in 1996 they were able to remove all the executive power to the White House to the president giving to the Congress all the 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 the, the power to uh, remove the blockade or to remove the sanctions um, under certain consideration including the human rights the role of Cuba in Latin America the all those things. And they are trying to do the same with the Force Act and with the designation of, uh, as a terrorist state. state. We have a question online and then a question in the back. There's two more online. Two more online. And so the one, the next one online is, uh, I have a question to Mr. Alejandro. What does the U.S. want from Cuba if they normalize their relationship with Cuba? How would Cuba's government use the demand as a way to talk with the U.S.? Uh, with that. Uh, regarding the U.S. government, uh, we uh, think that they, uh, we don't know what, what are the demands by the U.S. because all this, all the issues that they used to mention and to say is about asking for things that we will not do. So all the conditions, all the preconditions, or all the different arguments that the US has been mentioning for decades, with the maybe with the exception of the last two years of the Obama administration, in order to uh, have a different relation with Cuba, are issues and or are uh, things that we uh, cannot accept about changing our political system or about doing things in, in, in Cuba that it's just a matter or it's just a, a something that the Cuban people uh, has to decide and not, it's, it's, it's not something that we are uh, ready to uh, even to, uh, to, to accept by because that's not a part of the international normal of the international relations 
or some kind of a request or condition that has been set by the US are against the international law or even against the normal relation between, between countries or like. Uh, we really don't uh, used to see too much to the demands by the US. And in the case of Cuba, we haven't had any demands to the US government in our relation with the, with the, with them. Since the beginning of the revolution, all our um, uh, presidents, uh, Fidel, Raul, and then Diaz Canel, have said very clear that we are uh, very uh, willing to discuss an issue with the US as in a very respectful way, but we have no demands to the US. We are not asking the US to do a specific change to the healthcare system to have a better relation with Cuba. We are not asking the US to make a specific change to the treatment of African-Americans or minorities in the US to have a better relation with Cuba. We have not asked the US to remove from dozens of military bases around the world to have a better relation with Cuba. We are just saying that we have will to discuss, we are willing to uh, to have a conversation about any issues, including human rights, but with no any specific preconditions or uh, having uh, or previously asking the US to do something either domestic or internationally uh, previous to talk with you. Absolutely a sovereign to a nation to a sovereign nation, right? Mm -hmm. Discussions on there. Do we want to uh, one more online and then to the back? Okay, the last the last one right now online is um unless somebody asks any more, please comment more on the U.S. government policy to overthrow the Cuban government since 1959, or I mean I'm sorry, Bay of Pigs invasion to Cuba support the fight against apartheid South Africa's invasion of Angola while the U.S. government supported South Africa. I, no, I think that we uh, could talk for hours about the, the problems by the U.S. to dismantle the, 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 the Cuban revolution. Uh, as uh, the, the person who asked mentioned about the Bay of Peaks, uh, but we have to, we could talk about the Mongoose operation for five years by the CIA to, uh, to, uh, to, to make sabotage or the act of terrorism in, in our country the support of a illegal um, arms banned in, in the mountains of Cuba uh, and, and all the atrocities that uh, during the, uh, the 60s, those bans uh, committed in our country. So I think that uh, the history is very long. Um, the actions by the US government are at least instigated or at least uh, promoted or at least uh, funded by the US government it is it's a very long history of actions uh, against our country, against our population. Yeah, just to add on a bit, I think there's three like main fronts of the US war against Cuba. There's the economic war through sanctions, there's the media war to demonize Cuba and to justify these sanctions. And then there's the actual like covert warfare and all of these different fronts have the aim of overthrowing the Cuban government simply through different means all working together. Um, but as the person who asked the question mentioned, like there has been this history of direct intervention, invasion through the Bay of Pigs, funding terrorist attacks, whether it's bombing hotels or planes. Um, and now I think it's definitely become more covert. You know, the National Endowment for Democracy is a CIA cutout to cover up how the CIA is directly funding or working on a lot of these uh, programs under the guise of so-called democracy promotion. Um, and still they're using especially social media to try to foment a uh, counter-revolution in Cuba and to detach that from the role that the US is playing, that the right wing in Miami is playing and making it seem like it's the entire Cuban people that um, supports this. So that's the immense power that the US media has. You know, during the July 11th protests, like the US media is broadcasting videos of protesters, uh, protesters that are literally protesting, defending the revolution, marching with President Miguel Diaz Canel. And US news outlets are broadcasting this footage saying, oh, these people are protesting the revolution. So they're really able to like manipulate information. And because of the blockade, most US people don't have good access to like direct information on the ground in Cuba. So all of this is part of the, the counter-revolution. And I think we're having to get 
um, we have to investigate more. We have to dig deeper to see the connections that the U.S. has to these groups because they've realized, oh, we can't just like directly fund people to invade <clears> Cuba because <throat> people don't like that. We have to be a lot more covert now. Yeah. Just just to add something, minutes ago I mentioned the Helms Burton Law. In 1996, the Helms Burton Law um, obligates each American government, each American president, to uh, provide 20 million of dollar of dollar annually to subvert the Cuban social, economic, and political reality. So it's no matter. It doesn't matter if the president is more liberal or more conservative, or no matter each president, each department of state or each administration has to provide with 20 million of dollar each year to subvert, to create, uh, to, post, uh, uh, to, to, to build a political uh, opposition in Cuba, to create new political parties or new political organizations just to confront the, the government and to, uh, uh, to do illegal things in our internal uh, way of political life. Um, this is the law of the U.S. giving 20 million of dollars annually, more than 500 million of dollars in 20 years, in 25 years. So that's part of the essential part of the policy, using creating uh, news media, Q and uh, uh, outlets to uh, to uh, make a defamations about our reality, to find example of, of of disruption in our economy, just to destroy the image of Q in the international arena and, in, and, and to put all these elements in the minds of the Cuban population internally in order to create a perfect storm to uh, uh, make kind of an event like the 11th July. So this is just about to how to create a, 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 a painting which we can justify either a humanitarian intervention or, a, or an army intervention. That's a reality in the last three or decades or 35 years that we have faced. And it's a failed policy. It hasn't worked. Where has that money gone? Sitla? If I can, before, I, mean, I wanted to just make a comment piggybacking on what I'm saying, is that this is US taxpayers' money going, that could be going to helping the benefit people here that don't have health care, don't have all that stuff. And it's taxpayer money, our money going to violate the spirit of the UN Charter, which is a violation, everything you described is a violation of the sovereignty of the country. But anyway, I just thought that we should make that perfectly clear. Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to mention last week, the entrepreneurs that came from Cuba, they were talking about how um, the US economy has been directly benefiting from the suppression and suffocating the Cuban economy, specifically in Florida, and how these industries are popping up, such as charging people enormous amounts of money for remittances. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this mini economy popping up in the US um, and that's like benefiting off of the suffering in Cuba. Mm -hmm. We have no data really maybe to, to sustain that kind of approach about um, how the policy by the US, uh, specifically in Florida, can uh, prop up the, some businesses in, in, in Florida uh, the, at the time when the Cuban people is suffering for the sanctions. But personally, um, I think that maybe officially we, what we have been trying to, uh, to do not only between American and Cuban companies, even between the Cuban companies and the Cuban American person and Cuban American companies is just to promote the links between our two countries, between the two peoples on how to take advantage of the that trade that was said during the Obama when the cruises uh, went to Cuba, four or five cruises on daily basis went to Cuba and uh, thousands of Americans uh, docking in, in the in the Havana port and visited the restaurant of the private people and all the benefits that the Cuban entrepreneurial and the Cuban population in general and not only in Havana uh, took because of the that new era that Obama set that's uh, the scene that we uh, used to promote more trade more links even uh, the, even during the Trump administration we uh, 
uh, have example of uh, Q1 Holding Biotech Group working with the Roswell Park in New York to make uh, trials for a new vaccine for lung cancer and the neck and head cancer vaccine. So that's our, our goal, how to, uh, even despite of the fact that we have this very comprehensive and damaging skin assumption, how can we even to overcome that doing new, better things for both, uh, for both sides? It's a great question and certainly worth looking into more. We do know, for instance, I believe it's Continental that flies to Cuba that charges $200 for um, put checking one bag if you're going to Cuba. There was also a comment, I don't have my notes from last week's meeting about fees for, for remittances back to the island. Uh, I, so it, it is worth looking because there's somebody's gaining somebody's profiting and and following the money trail isn't always a bad idea so thank you yeah i think the healthcare industry is a great example of where the us has or us companies have this great incentive to maintain the blockade is cuz the cuban healthcare system is people oriented it's not profit oriented and the us people are blocked from accessing life saving cuban medications and part of that is because it would disrupt big pharma's monopoly on these products. Like diabetes is a great example. Cuba's uh, diabetes ulcer medica medication could save 100,000 mm -hmm. US people a year from getting amputated. Mm -hmm. But of course, like keeping insulin prices high is extremely profitable instead of actually trying to cure these diseases or do preventative care. Same goes for Cuba's lung cancer vaccine, which US people don't have access to. And US pharma companies, of course, don't want to come into the US and actually be helping people because they want to maintain their super profits. Any other comments or questions? Any other comments or questions online or in the audience? I would like to invite our uh, the panelists to any last comments uh, before we close. Alejandro? Oh, just to say again, thank you to uh, Latin American Working Group to National Network of Cuba and to the IPS for the for for inviting the embassy to come today uh, and to thank also for all the efforts that the different organizations like yours are, uh, have been doing on um, on denouncing on urging the the Biden administration and the American political uh, government in general to um, to remove the sanctions uh, mainly because of the humanitarian impact that the sanctions uh, have had on our country and our people and to thank uh, uh, again for for that effort great thank you kala thank you so much to all the organizers for putting this together thank you to the fellow panelists and i just want to ask people to go to nnoc.org off the list register to take part in this weekend of action sign up for activities whether it's in your town or if you're coming to dc there's so many ways to get involved and we really have to make our voices loud and make biden know that the u.s people do not stand for this cruel policy against cuba Great, thank you both. Thank you. And thanks to our audience online and in the room. Have a wonderful day.